Hello and welcome to the Leaders' Council podcast with me, Scott Challoner. This podcast, just like the Leaders' Council itself, is all about recognising and celebrating those people who keep this great country running. We exist to give leaders a voice outside of their own organisations and to support them in the same way that they support their staff every single day of the week. Now, if you are in a leadership role yourself and would like to have your voice heard on the national stage, then please do visit leaderscouncil.co.uk forward slash apply. Now, each week on this programme, I'm joined by a different leadership figure from the world of business, education, politics, sport, or even from local communities in the aim of truly discovering who those people are that get up every morning and make this country work. We get their take on the current economic and political landscape of the UK and discuss everything from making key decisions to educating our children and, of course, the success and the innovation that makes it all worthwhile in the end. On the programme today, I'm delighted to be joined by Kerry Hill, head teacher at Ayers Monsalt Primary School in Leicester. Despite being in a catchment area of significant deprivation, Kerry's leadership has seen the school go from strength to strength with progress rates by the end of Key Stage 2 among the best in the country nationally. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Kerry onto the programme. Uh, Kerry, welcome and thank you for joining us. No, hello and thank you for having me. It's a real pleasure, Kerry. Um, certainly isn't the nicest day for it weather-wise, but at least we're in and inside and away from the rain. Um, I suppose we should start by addressing the elephant in the room here, shouldn't we? And that's the fact that although, according to the government's roadmap out of social restrictions, Freedom Day seems to be going ahead on July the 19th, we're still living under some form of curtailment of freedoms, aren't we? And that's been the case now for the best part of the last 15 months, going way back to March of last year. So looking back at the whole sort of COVID-19 pandemic by and large, how has it affected you and the school since that time? Um, I think as all leaders would say, in, in a variety of ways, it's had a massive impact. Um, I mean, geographically, my school is in the city of Leicester, um, and it kind of feels like we've been in some form of lockdown pretty much for the whole of the last kind of 15 going on 16 months, because obviously... Uh, Leicester was was one of those that kind of had to carry on having those more stringent measures. Mm. Um, so it's for, as a leader, it, it's been a myriad of, of different emotions, juggling and spinning different plates from just simply the operational running of the school. Um, we've had to kind of turn lights off within 24, 48 hours, turn them back on again. Um, you know, as an education profession, we've had to compare challenge the way that we actually teach and the way that children learn and again especially in a primary school and we have a nursery and reception um, so trying to figure out how three and four year olds kind of tackle digital education and remote education how we support parents um, both in terms again of, of what that remote education at home would look like but also helping them with their own mental health and well-being because for them at home, it's suddenly very, very different. Lots of different stresses and pressures. Um, but also actually then looking at looking the staff um, because, again, staff are not just teachers or teaching assistants or, or people in a school building that are suddenly having their professional lives completely changed in the way that we work um but they're also people too so they have the same worries the same anxieties some of our staff have been clinically extremely vulnerable so it's meant a really long time you know not physically in a building and part of a team um it's, it's been a whole range of things um as a head i have to say i think the timeliness of guidance has not helped us sometimes mm. things have come very last minute um or it feels like things have come in an evening or a school holiday or a weekend um so it's been a really long kind of 15 months um and ultimately you know it's it's our responsibility to make sure everybody in our building is safe um, so trying to make the school as COVID secure as we can um, and protect the pupils and the staff and also our wider community has been really important to us. Um, and that has meant a complete 
shift in terms of how we operate. Um, you know, as humans, we we crave connection. Um, and certainly in my school, encouraging children to build character and relationships and personal and social skills is really, really important. And suddenly as for adults and children, when you can't have those connections and you're, you're having to try and limit your movement and limit your contact, um, there's so many different implications, both in terms of curriculum, but as I say, that, that social and emotional side. Um, but we feel we've done the best that we can and we've always done what we believe is the right thing for us as a school. Um, we were a school as well that had a check from the health and safety executive in terms of our COVID safety measures. Um, and that went really, really well. And, and there was nothing that they could suggest to, to improve what we were doing. Um, so actually, I'm really confident that we've done as much as we can to keep people safe um, in terms of changing the building, having more staff rooms, you know, sanitizer stations, literally every couple of meters, sometimes it feels like, to, you know, trying to still provide an interesting, engaging curriculum for our children, um, but just in a, in a COVID safe way. And in terms of being able to adapt to this new sort of COVID reality, would you say that it's sort of required a change of leadership style from yourself as well, in a way? I think it's I think it's been um it's been a very interesting ride as a leader. Um I have to say I think I think the education profession is very resilient anyway and very adaptable. Um but I think as as a leader that, that adaptability and resilience has had to be there even more so. Um I mean in terms of leadership, I think flexibility of that style that you use is really important. Um, but also, we in my school, we've we've literally just done kind of a year long, well, it's about eighteen months now, project um, on psychological safety and what are our behaviours mindset. Um, and what's been really useful for me is I know that as a as a whole, my staff on the whole, actually, their natural preferences for style is quite empathetic, it's very people-centred. And COVID was suddenly a very fast-paced type of, of leadership that was needed, um, you know, that quite decisive, making judgment. Because as a staff, we know we're very empathetic, we know we're people-centred, we're, we're not a kind of focus-driven in a lot of the personalities we have. But actually, we've got to be that fast-paced for a little bit because we've got to put all these measures in place so trying to find for me the blend of what worked for my organization needing to be people-centered needing to involve people needing to understand how they were feeling what were their fears what were their anxieties and, and how could I support and alleviate some of those whilst needing to have of um, challenge and determination and a very decisive plan um, was was a blend we needed. Mm. Um, so certainly I think having an awareness of different behaviours and different mindsets as a leader and being able to be, I suppose, emotionally intelligent and know what you need to do at what point to get the best effect um, has probably been the most the most interesting time really is ahead of, of really recognizing that how you empower people, how you get people to do something in a really challenging time um, has, has really been a learning journey for all of us. Mm. And one of the ways that the education sector has adapted to sort of the lockdown period is rolling out sort of online and digital education. But that mm -hmm. whole process has unearthed a great deal of inequality when it comes to digital poverty, hasn't it? And that has become a major issue and it will 
consistently become a major issue as long as online learning and technology continues to play more of a role in our day-to-day lives in education. So when the government talks about building back better, just how important is it in your view that that gap with regards to digital poverty is closed? I think it's really interesting because, as you say, my school is is based in an area with high disadvantage. Mm. Uh, We have about 40% of our children across the school um, are uh, disadvantaged. It actually increased to more than that. We've got some classes in Key Stage 2 that are over 60%. Um, I mean, we've had over 100 digital devices go out. We've also been able to access uh, through some mobile phone companies. Because it isn't physically just the digital device. It's actually that our families don't even have internet access. Um, So there's been a lot of barriers that we had to jump through. But then I think we actually made some assumptions um, that we then also had to kind of go, ah, actually, we need to work on that. So kind of assuming, okay, once we've got internet access and once we've got a digital device for a child, great, they can go on whatever platform you're using. But actually, for young children who may still need support, kind of assuming also that, that our community had the digital skills that they needed to support children, actually, some of our families didn't. Um, so some of our families, we were having to have actual conversations with the parents and the carers to explain how they got on digital access um, or send out, you know, a lot of screenshots of how to access things. Um, and we ended up providing as well for the risk process. We ended up providing really early on for people just to come in and actually get some digital skills to actually help the children and for the children to be more confident in actually accessing that digital learning. And so I think as a school, the whole digital question has has been massive and we have very much risen to it. Um, But I think the inequality that we've seen actually goes beyond digital devices. Um, For us, you know, we've had to actually just send out pens, paper, pens, because they were things that weren't weren't in people's houses. Um, again, some of our families that are in a kind of box of flats or don't have gardens, and obviously physical health is so important. Um, we've had to send out, you know, games packs or physical activity things that people can do, um, because actually some of our houses and households just don't have some of the basic essentials that we need, let alone a digital device. Um, So that equality for us has gone way beyond just a digital divide, and it's really made it quite apparent um, the lack of resources that some of our families do have. Yes, and this is all within the background of lost learning as well, isn't it? I understand that pupil progress is at the forefront of your priorities at Ayers Monsell, and you've always performed incredibly well over the years, despite being in a catchment area in the lowest 10% of deprivation nationally. And it's left you with an uphill task to get pupils to catch up on their learning. Um, Indeed, the Education Policy Institute has found that by the first half of the 2020 autumn term, of course, pupils had already fallen behind with their learning by up to two months in reading and up to three months in mathematics and then learning losses in schools that have sort of a higher cohort of pupils from disadvantaged backgrounds was also found to be 50 percent higher than schools with fewer pupils from such backgrounds on july the 2nd this year we then saw another report come out from the education endowment foundation looking at the second lockdown from january to march of this year and with that now taken into account it's estimated that disadvantaged pupils in key stage one could have lost as many as eight months of learning. Mm. This lost yeah. learning is a very serious issue, isn't it? And when it comes to Ayers Monsal, what sorts of steps have you been taking to try and bring in catch-up interventions? I mean, lost learning is a massive issue, but, but this is where I think as a country, as a government, as an education sector, short-term catch-up just is not going to work. You know, we need a long-term recovery plan. Um, I, I think the, the negative language that's sometimes used over a lost 
generation and, and that kind of term, we understand it, but actually we can't use COVID as an excuse. Um, and as a leader, I'm not prepared to allow COVID to be an excuse for why our children in our school do not progress and leave us at least at the national average, but we always push for above that. And as you say, um, in particular, our disadvantaged children um, make excellent progress and actually make progress in excess of um, kind of national averages, even for non-disadvantaged peers. Um, I think for, for other schools, what we're acutely aware of is we talk about learning and we talk about academic progress. But ultimately, there are now children sitting in year one um, where, you know, early reading, early writing is, is critical. And as you said, the Education Endowment Foundation are saying, you know, children are now seven months behind in year one. But we forget children have lost half of their reception year. And that reception year in terms of learning social skills, learning personal skills, developing behavior for learning, developing a positive attitude for learning. For some of our children, just actually learning to sit on a carpet for 20 minutes so that I can engage in a 20-minute comic lesson is, is something that it takes them a while to develop in, in foundation. And actually, they've missed that whole chunk of that. So, so for, for us, we're really passionate in our school that we aren't going to address the learning loss until we've addressed these personal, social, emotional and mental health skills first so that actually our children have a positive attitude to learning, have the skills that they need to engage in learning and engage with other people and actually are motivated and want to learn. Um, and for many of our children, you know, they've had these massive gaps of consistency in terms of being in school. We've also then had, you know, bubble closures. So we've had year groups that in addition to those national closures, they've actually had four or five bubble closures as well, which again is, is potentially another kind of six, seven, eight weeks, depending on when those closures were. So I completely understand why these reports are saying, actually, there is this significant learning loss. And we have now got to look at what we do to accelerate and close that gap. But we're very aware it has to be a blend of that academic achievement and academic catch up and social and emotional intervention and support to actually enable our children to concentrate to persevere with a task, to, you know, have a positive attitude to the task and, and be willing and wanting to actually learn. So we spend a lot of our, our recovery curriculum, if you like, has been focused on those personal social elements alongside. Then obviously we have enhanced our focus on, in particular, reading, because reading underpins the whole curriculum. So really trying to flood our children every day, um, both at home and in school, um, with, with those early reading skills. Um, I think it's interesting, actually, that you picked up about the report, particularly about Key Stage 1, um, because that's been something that we found is our children in our Key Stage 1 have not narrowed the gap as quickly um, in particular, as our children kind of in year five and six. Mm. And again, you know, we know that we strive to have a, an active, engaging curriculum um, that's built around discussion and dialogue, active learning, you know, children having those rich first hand experiences in order to fully deepen the learning that, that they're doing. But I think, as I said earlier, that's really difficult for a four, five, six-year-old to do on remote learning. Mm. So we haven't, haven't been able to give that lovely, rich, practical, active, play-based, experience-based curriculum 
um, that we would normally give our key stage one children that's really, you know, oracy and language rich uh, because it's really difficult to do that with a young child sitting on a digital device. Um, so I'm not surprised, therefore, there is a difference in terms of key stage one to key stage two. And I think also our key stage two children have been more resilient to cope with, with that move to digital learning. Um, so they've been able to kind of be more self-motivated, more self-directed, certainly are, are more ambitious and able children have then kind of taken learn that they've done and then gone on an, an almost an additional project-based work at home. Uh, so for our key stage two, the digital learning was much more successful. Um, I think going back to your question, you said, what do we now do? Um, we now kind of go, right, we've, we've got to crack on and get it right. Um, again, we're really lucky. We are involved in some of the government programs that have been set up. Uh, so we're doing the Nuffield Early Language Initiative within our foundation stage. So again, really focusing on oracy language reading. Um, and I'm really, really pleased that we're actually involved with uh, the National Literacy Trust with their Change in the Story reading program, which is which is again aimed at Key Stage One, and in particular our disadvantaged children, um, to really try and again accelerate that that basic phonics of reading skills. Um, we have a very clear strategic uh, recovery plan. You know, we're looking very carefully at how we use this additional money that's coming in from, from the government for catch-up and for COVID recovery. So we are then looking at additional things like academic coaching, small group tutoring. But again, we've been able to stick with that ethos to support mental health and well-being. Uh, so since we returned in, in April, um, our most vulnerable children and some who have had some quite traumatic experiences during the pandemic have actually been getting access to a paediatric uh, nurse who specialises in mental health. Um, and for us, giving those additional opportunities to help children bridge some of these barriers to then enable them to be more, more productive and get back to learning um, is is really important. So it is that that blend of a strategic focused improvement we're very much trying to do. And I understand as well that this focus on mental health and mindset isn't just something that's come about during the COVID period because your school, as Monsal, conducted a project where you psychologically profiled staff, didn't you, so that they knew their own mindsets and their own behaviours and could then access training and coaching themselves to help adjust those mindsets to make themselves more effective in how they teach the children. So thinking about that, what sort of tactics are deployed to sort of help change mindsets? And is this also something that you're sort of carrying on with now? Yeah, so about 2017, um, mental health is something that we really picked up on as a school. Uh, the government produced a behaviour uh, report um, and we very much picked up on that again, for those challenging children and children who are coming into a school with kind of early childhood experiences uh, around trauma, uh, that actually mental health was quite critical to childhood development and also um, the, the kind of development through learning. Um, and we also uh, were very, very fortunate to be honoured to receive the prestigious Princess Royal Training Award. And that was specifically for the impact of our staff training to do with mental health. Um, our project to do with psychological profiling is, is called Spotlight. When we started this project, uh, it was about saying to staff, if you, you know, we want to create a culture of well-being, but actually everybody in this building plays a part in what that culture looks like. So how you pave, how you act, how, what you're modelling to other people and modelling to our people, you know, 
everybody, no matter what post and role you have in the school, you're part of this culture that we want to develop. So we started working with a psychologist on, on the Spotlight Project. And it was just a very short kind of 30-minute um, survey, survey online. It's, it's, it's a self-help guide. It tells you what is your natural preference um, in terms of your behavior and in terms of your mindset. And that's really important because when we get stressed um, or when we're under pressure, we naturally default to, to that particular preference. Um, but actually, that preference might not be the most effective in a particular situation to bring about the most positive outcome. Um, and I can remember when I did my uh, MPQH, my National Headship Qualification, uh, we did a survey and you kind of almost sometimes get labelled. I don't know if you've ever done anything with it, Scott, but you sometimes get labelled as you're a red, you're a yellow, you're a green and you're a blue. Um, and this suggestion almost of, if you're a red as a senior leader, then on your team, you need somebody who is green or somebody who is blue. And actually, the spotlight profile and program goes against that. It goes, no, 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 no. You may have a preference for being red, but actually, you can learn to be yellow, green, and blue as well. You can move. You can flex into these different areas so that you can cope better and be more effective in that situation. So we all have situations that we're not as comfortable, we're not as confident in, but by using the profile, you're able to kind of recognize that beforehand and you have that self-awareness to be able to go, do you know what? That is going to be difficult for me. I'm not sure my natural preference is going to work in that situation. So maybe I need to be, maybe I need to flex because I'm, you know, if somebody is naturally forceful is one of the styles, maybe I need to be more logical or maybe I need to be more expressive. And if, if you can move within the different styles, um, it helps you to be more effective, but it also might help the other people you're relating to. And it's been a real, real catalyst but as in school, um, all of us now have learned the language of, of, I say, the cope, the flex. Um, so you hear actually having wonderful conversations about, actually, I think I need to be a bit more forceful here. Or, oh, maybe I didn't do that as logically. Um, or recognising that if you're a senior leader and you're naturally empathetic, um, but you need to go into a situation you're, where you're a bit more forceful. Um, you can actually preempt that and, and try and move into that. Um, and as I say, for our culture, it's been great, and we are carrying on with it um, because it, it's just given us that opportunity where everybody is involved, everybody has self-awareness, everybody knows, their behaviours, their mindsets, and are in control of those. So it isn't just about me as a head teacher going, right, to support your mental health, I'm going to give you this, 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 and this. It's actually about our staff saying, for me to have the best mental well-being I can, I recognise that maybe I might need to shift this behaviour or this mindset. I'm actually not getting as stressed out if there's an issue with workload or there's a situation that's coming up that, that I might be a bit anxious about. Um, and I say we've, we've absolutely loved it. Um, so much so that we're now looking at this psychosocial model and we're actually now developing uh, with psychologists again um, a children's version um, to try and develop character skills and that self-awareness of behaviour and mindset as part of our curriculum with the children.
And that sounds like it's going to be immensely important over the next few months and years as children look to sort of recover in terms of mental health from the traumas of the pandemic and also catch up on that lost learning. And if we start to think about that future now that may be on the horizon as we start to sort of leave social restrictions behind, where do you see Ayers Monsell as a school being by the end of the next academic year in 2022? And what do you think is the next step that the education sector needs to take by and large to make sure that the children of this country are in the best possible place? I think, I think for so as Monsal as a school, but also the education sector as a whole, um, the actual pandemic and absolutely how resilient we are as a profession. Um, it's shown that, you know, we have massive strengths in terms of our adaptability, our creativity, um, but also within as Monsal and, and the wider profession, actually the collegiality that we have. Um, you know, the, the team at Ayers Monsell absolutely came together um, to do the best that they could for our children, for our families, but also for the team. Um, and there was very much that, that absolute kind of responsibility to ensure that everybody in our building was, was safe, was well, but was also being supported to continue doing the best that they could. Um, as I said earlier, I think education moving forward in the next 12 months, it, it can't just be a short-term plan. We need a long-term recovery plan. But I think also we've got an opportunity now to actually rethink some of the educational values that we have within the education sector. Um, and again, kind of within our own school, we've all, we've already started kind of recognising the value of, of social, emotional, kind of personal skills. Um, but I think now more than ever, we need to be, you know, as a professional body with, with a professional voice, kind of looking at the very individualised performance and competitive system the very high stakes accountability that is part of our sector and actually going, you know, is, is this the right thing now? Um, or what is the best way that we can both effectively but also, you know, working with, with children and young adults compassionately create an education system that enables them to have the skills, the knowledge and ability to be successful citizens for the future, but in the most effective way. And I think now is the time to be having those conversations of what does that effectiveness look like? Is it a high stakes, high accountability, high pressure environment? Or as I said, is there a more humanistic and holistic way that we can still drive for those high standards, but in a way that supports all of those other facets of, of personal, social, emotional, and, and life skills that these children need to go into, not just the 21st century, but I have children in, in the school that actually we're thinking now of for the 22nd century. Um, and what is the best way that we can do that? Um, as a school, our, our strap line and offset picked up it. Our kind of underlying motto is, is no excuses. COVID will not be an excuse for us in the next 12 months in not helping our children move forward and reaching their potential, whatever that potential might be. Um, and certainly that academic acceleration is, is of key focus for us. Um, in terms of next step planning, as well as, as I say, ensuring that we have the personal, social, emotional skills to enable our pupils, but also enable our staff to learn and achieve to the highest possible standards that they can. Um, I think certainly in the next 12 months, staff training and development is going to be really important. 
um, not just from a kind of mental health and well-being side, because, you know, we need to make sure staff are prepared for conversations around trauma, bereavement and mental health. But actually, as we introduce some of these these initiatives to try and drive uh, forward academic acceleration and making sure our staff are really confident and have that strong pedagogical understanding of, you know, what's the best way children can learn? How can I structure this lesson or these series of lessons to make sure children get everything out of it that they possibly can? And actually, if they don't, what can I do to change that for next time? So I think it's mix of that real at the heart questioning now of, of what is the right thing for us as an education sector. And then with the more practical kind of training, development, and ultimately that relentless focus that the children have to come out of this and still be in a strong position um, that they can go and go and achieve and be successful throughout the rest of their educational journey and their lives. It's going to be a huge mission for the sector to take on over the course of the uh, the next year and few years, of course. And it's something that we at the Leaders' Council will be keeping a very, very close eye on. And we do wish Ayers Monsall as a school all the best of luck in the world in trying to make that vision a reality. And also, Kerry, just before we do wrap up, um, I should also um, ask that you take care and stay safe still with everything that is still going on, because we aren't quite out of the woods with the COVID situation yet. But I'm confident that better days are ahead of us. And as we start also to understand exactly what sort of shape the recovery for education is taking, I'd relish the opportunity to have you back onto the show with us just to discuss how it's coming along, because there are still a great many uncertainties with regards to how it's going to pan out. I think that's for certain. No, that would be be lovely. And yeah, it would be great to continue the... uh the conversation with you and, and also those other educational practitioners may be listening. Um, so I say, you know, starting this, this change process and, and making a better system coming out of COVID than, than we went into it with. Exactly. I've thoroughly enjoyed having you on the programme with us today, Kerry. It's been really eye-opening and really thought-provoking for myself and the listeners. And once again, do take care and do stay safe with all still going on. And I'll look forward to uh, speaking again in future for sure. Thank you very much, Scott. I was speaking on today's show to Kerry Hill, head teacher at Ayers Monsell Primary School in Leicester, and I do hope that you all thoroughly enjoyed a compelling interview. Until next time, now that indoor hospitality has returned, I'll be heading back to my usual spot in the Westminster Arms to raise a glass to outstanding leadership, and hopefully over the coming weeks we'll keep taking further strides toward normal life. Remember everyone, please do continue to look after yourselves and be considerate of others because it makes such a difference in preserving lives during this time. We're almost there now and better days are ahead of us. Please take care and goodbye.